This program is made possible in part by a grant from Humanities Texas, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sue Taylor. I'm the Senior Education Curator here. Summer camps, school groups, hands-on stuff, lectures, all that comes under my purview. And I'm very pleased today to present Dr. Yolanda Leva. She is the Chair of History at the uh, University of Texas at El Paso. She has done a lot, a lot of work on Chicana history, on the history of the border. And she also did some work at Socorro. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Yolanda Leva. I'm so happy to be here today. And I want to thank Sue Taylor and the History Museum for the invitation to be here. You know, as historians, we often do our work and then we move on. And what I appreciate about Sue is that she asked me to revive some work that I had done with a group of students back in 2002 and 2005, when we did some projects in Socorro that resulted in these publications. These are the last existing copies that I own anyway. <laughs> and a group of graduate students trained a group of high school students how to do oral histories, and we interviewed people in the community. And while Sue was planning these lectures, I told her that one of the things that they talked about was about the mission being the heart of the community. And this is how this talk today came about. Since I'm a borderlands historian, I thought that I would give you a background in the borderlands just a bit and get us to think about Socorro and to think about the Lower Valley a little bit. There are people in here who know more than I do about the Lower Valley. And I welcome you to, to chime in. Is anyone here from the Lower Valley? I'd like to let you know when you want the lights out, there is a flap on your podium there if you wish to. Let me know when you want the lights out. So, are we fine with the lights out? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, lights out. I don't need, I don't need. Um. Okay, there we go. So let's think about the borderlands for a moment. The borderlands is a concept that academics began to use about 100 years ago to think about the places now in the United States that were once under the control of Spain. And we think about the borderlands now as the US-Mexico border in particular. And sometimes we think about what happened before the border existed. Sometimes we think about the effect of the border. And here in El Paso, we know the effect of the border and the way that it sometimes divides families, makes it difficult for us to visit friends and family on the other side. Uh, the ways that people are creative in the borderlands as far as crossing. Let me give you a, a 20th century example of creativity. After the Chinese Exclusion Act of the 1880s. Many Chinese people moved to Mexico. Others came from China to northern Mexico to cross to the United States. There was a school in Juarez, I say a school in Juarez, that taught Chinese men how to act and look Mexican so that they could cross as Mexicans. So the borderlands is a fascinating place. It's a creative place. It's a difficult place. The border is a place where people have come together very often in conflict, very often in violence, very often in the sharing of cultures. And our particular borderlands is a, is a place that is shaped in part by being in the desert. Here's a map showing the Chihuahuan Desert. So it's an extensive desert. Here's a photo from our beautiful mountains. So being in the desert shapes our lives. It shapes what we can do, what we cannot do. It shapes what we see every day. 
So the desert is part of us. It was part of the lives of our ancestors. It's going to be part of the lives of our descendants. The other thing that shapes our experiences and that shaped the experiences of people in places like Socorro was the river. People have come to this place to settle for thousands of years. Weko tanks, for example, uh, some people believe had settlements going back 10,000 years because of the presence of water. And we know, even in the 21st century, how precious water is and how water is something, well, we're water. We need water to survive. So water is precious. You know how we've been having all these rains lately? Have you looked at the mountains? The green of the mountains? Have you ever noticed how within hours of a rain the mountains change colors? So to be by a river shaped the history of this borderlands, shaped the history of our communities in the borderlands. And the river that we see now is not the river. It's not even the river of my youth. It's not the river of 300 years ago. It's not the river of 400 years ago. So when I say that the river shapes this place, when I'm talking historically, think of a big, beautiful, strong river, not the river that we see today. Here's a map of El Paso County from the 1890s. And let me see if I can use this clicky thing. Kind of. There's Socorro. So you see that it's right by the river. So the river shaped the communities of the lower valley in terms of economics, especially in terms of agriculture, in terms of even community work. People would come together to build the irrigation canal. So it was part of community building, not just part of the, the agricultural part. When our students and I went to Socorro about 10 years ago and we began to talk to people in the community, one of the things that they told us over and over and over again was everything's changed. Everything's changed. There used to be a cotton field right there. There used to be a cotton field over there. We'd be in a parking lot. We'd be in Socorro High School and they would say, when I was growing up, this was a field. And while they understood, like we all do, that things change, I could hear a sadness in their voice that, that the cotton fields were disappearing, that the plants were disappearing. Well, as we look back at the history of Socorro and of the mission, it's a history of change. So I have up here as an example, 1768 map of the area including what is now the Lower Valley, an 1862 sketch of Isleta del Sur. Socorro High School today, where we did the interviews. So change is continual, and the role of the mission in Socorro is also a history of change. A great deal of change came to what became Socorro, what became Isleta, Senecu, San Lorenzo, through the, the period of exploration of, of expeditions by, by Spanish uh, colonizers. So here's a list of just some of the expeditions that went through the area, along with an example of a colonial document, just so you can see and appreciate people who do work in the colonial period, because they have to learn how to read this. So it's not just reading in Spanish, but it's reading that handwriting. So it was shaped by the coming of not just different people, not just Spanish and mixed race people, but the coming of a whole different system, a system that was created to take wealth back to Spain, a system that was created to force indigenous people into labor, 
a system that was created to force indigenous people to become Hispanicized. In the 1650s, Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe de los Mansos was founded in Ciudad Juarez, where the cathedral is now. Here's an 1850s painting of the cathedral. And if you've gone to it, you can still see that building next to the more modern cathedral. So the first Spanish settlement is on the other side of the river, what we now know as Ciudad Juarez. The Mansos and the Cows and I were just talking about them before the lecture, were the people that were here when the first Spaniards arrived. They are the people that showed Juan de Oñate how to cross the river. They're the people that allowed Oñate and his expedition to survive. The expedition just having gone through the desert. You know, his, his chronicler, Oñate's chronicler, talks about how when they got to the river, the horses were so thirsty that the horses ran into the river and drank so much water, their stomachs exploded. Yeah. So the Manso people, and, and we don't know what they call themselves. The Spaniards call them Manso, which is a docile, peaceful, like horses are Manso. And People used to say that they didn't exist anymore, but we know they do. So the, the first mission in this area was in the 1650s, what is now Ciudad Juarez for the Manso people. So Spanish settlement in this area, and this area was part of colonial New Mexico. We weren't Texas. We were in Texas for a long time. We were New Mexico like I think we should be still. <laughs> and we were Chihuahua after the 1820s. But back then we were part of, of colonial New Mexico. Colonial New Mexico by 1600 starts to, to see settlement by Spanish authorities. And the Spanish authorities impose very harsh conditions on the indigenous people of New Mexico. The encomienda system, for example. The encomienda system was a system whereby, as a reward for conquering, the person would get land plus the people on the land. So it comes from, from the word, from the Spanish word to entrust. So it sounds nice. We're entrusting these people to you. But it was a form of slavery. It was a form of forced labor. It was very harsh. It had already been outlawed in the rest of Mexico. But because the Spanish government wanted people to come here to the north, to the periphery, to the place that people didn't want to go, they reinstituted it in New Mexico. So the encomienda system exists in slave labor. A harsh suppression of native spiritual practices including the, the killing of spiritual leaders, the destruction of spiritual or ceremonial items, the destruction of ceremonial buildings. And sometimes, and I don't really think that I can, but sometimes I try to think of what it would be like to experience that. And I will never, well, I don't think I'll ever know, but just from my 2013 eyes, I think, well, how did people survive that tremendous, that profound change in their lives? How did they survive that? People survive sometimes by hiding their spiritual practices. They survive by, by seeming to go along with what was happening. <clears throat> In 1680, and we just, we just had the, the commemoration of this in New Mexico, in 1680, there was the most successful indigenous revolt in the Americas ever. And 
a man by the name of Pope was one of the leaders. He was a spiritual leader. He had been publicly tortured and beaten five years earlier, along with a group of other spiritual leaders. And he was able, with others, to organize many pueblos to attack the Spanish uh, representatives of the government, the missionaries, to expel them from New Mexico. In the 1690s, when, when Spain regained control of New Mexico, they interviewed people who were part of the rebellion. And one of the things that has always struck me about that is that one of the older people they interviewed said, this was nothing new, this rebellion, he said. We've been planning it since I was a kid. <laughs> so the, the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 resulted in the expulsion of about 2,000 people from New Mexico, which in 1680 is a lot of people. And it included Spaniards and, and, and mixed race people and indigenous people. And they came here to El Paso del Norte. I put as an illustration a photo of a sculpture of Pope that's up in Washington, D.C. with the sculpture on Cliff Bragua. And you can see in the sculpture, I hope you can see that he's holding something knotted. So this is how people knew what day to attack because they knotted a deer skin. So everybody had, every Pueblo had one of those. Every day they would undo the knot. And when the knots were gone, that was the day to attack. So very successful for more than a decade, Native people regained control of New Mexico. And it dramatically increased the population of this area. As a result of the Pueblo Revolt, San Lorenzo was founded, Senecu, Isleta, Socorro. And you might know that there's an Isleta, New Mexico, for example. You might know that there's a Socorro, New Mexico. Well, the people from New Mexico came and gave their new place the same name. And here's a map, 1727, that shows Senecu, Isleta, Socorro, San Lorenzo, El Paso, which is Juarez. Do you notice anything about the map that is different? From now? The river, right? So the river moved. Right, and, and it moved a lot. <laughs> Which is what made the river a very bad boundary marker in 1848 when the United States won the war against Mexico. Don't make rivers boundaries. <laughs> you end up with problems like the Chamisa dispute. So suddenly, there are new settlements in this area. They, they become what we think of now as the lower valley of El Paso. And Socorro is one of these new settlements that's founded as a result of the Pueblo Revolt. About 600 Beatle people come to would become Socorro. And just to give you a sense of how everything was not pretty and nice still. The Pueblo revolts in 1680. The first church is, is established, a, a very a temporary kind of building. 1681 and 1683, the Piros attempt to kill the priest. So when we say that the mission is the heart of the community, it has a very messy history behind it. Right? It's a very complex history behind it. Because of the attempt to kill the priest, the church moved the building closer to Isleta for the safety of the priests. Right? So it's a very complex history and it's not always a, a pretty history. <laughs> <laughs> 
So let's think about what were missions for Native people. I have, I have two images for you to look at. One is a mural that's in Juarez at the cathedral. And one is from one of my favorite museums, the Bojaque Cultural Center, Roxanne Swenzel has these amazing sculptures. It's a museum that is from the Pueblo point of view. So here we have what I think is a very familiar kind of image to most of us. Growing up in Our Lady of Guadalupe Church here in El Paso, we had many huge paintings on the walls that looked just like this. So the indigenous people bowing down, being blessed by the priest, versus the priest whipping a native person. And when you see that sculpture in person, it's very striking. Because you don't see that image very much in public places. So what is the mission to indigenous people? It's not one or the other. It's many things to indigenous people. It is a place where people suffer. Because the missions are not just spiritual, the missions are economic. It's a place to gather people, to put them to work. In California, for example, by the time of Mexican independence, the largest landowner in California were the missions. The banks were the missions. So it's very much economic in nature. It's spiritual in nature. It's cultural in nature to try to assimilate people into Spanish culture. So, so it's both things. It's both that kind of, what word shall I use, of suffering, of harshness. Exploitation. Exploitation, That's a, that is a good word. And a spiritual place. You know, indigenous people in the colonial period and still today are very creative. And one of the ways that indigenous spiritual practices continued was by making them seem Catholic. In 1848, when here became part of the United States, the control of the Catholic Church has shifted. You know, the Catholic Church is um, controlled by, by nationally. It's, it's organized by nation. So from being controlled by the Mexican Catholic Church, it went to being controlled by the U.S. Catholic Church. And one of the things that the priests said when they would come to what is now the Southwest is, these people aren't Catholics, they're pagans. Like, they're not real Catholics. But what it was, was that indigenous people had made their practices part of Catholicism. And that's how it survived. So it's, it's a place where people could find ways for their culture to survive and a place of exploitation. And the heart of a community now. 1682, the mission is founded mostly with, with Biro people, but also with Dano, Jemez, other people over the decades, other indigenous people are part of the mission. And indigenous people go in and out of the missions. And that's true of all missions. The people come in and out as the mission serves them in a way. And many times they're forced to stay in, as part of the mission. So nothing is ever very clear cut. So here we have then, after 1680, after the Pueblo Revolt, the creation of these new communities. And remember, in the desert, by the river. And communities that are suffering and communities that are finding ways to thrive as well. But the other thing that shapes these communities and shapes, I think still shapes us today, is being on the periphery. Right? We always say in Atbasa, Washington doesn't understand us. Well, we say Austin doesn't understand us, <laughs> right? 
So being on the periphery, what does it mean for a community that is so isolated? Because we're talking about communities that are isolated from the center of political power, the center of economic power, the, the center of, of what's considered culture, Mexico City. And if you think of the 1600s, the 1700s, the 1800s, travel is incredibly hard. And if you've traveled in Mexico, you know that it's a very mountainous nation. So even getting goods from the economic center to way out here in, in colonial New Mexico, it's an incredibly hard task. So the communities are isolated. And sometimes that's good and sometimes it's bad. In communities like what is now the Lower Valley, there's fewer priests. There's fewer government officials. But there's also less education. But also people get to be what they want to be many times. So you could be mestizo, move to colonial New Mexico and say, I'm Spanish. And if you have the money, you're Spanish. So, so it's, it's a fluid place in many ways. So if we think of these communities in the desert, communities by the river, if we think of communities that are so isolated on the periphery, what creates community? What creates a sense of community? And this is true of all communities, I think. But if we think about it in terms of Socorro, Senecu, Isleta, San Lorenzo, the landscape, of course, of the geography, shared experiences. What experiences do people share? Like digging the irrigation canals and who's in charge of them. And it still is in rural places in New Mexico and Colorado very important. A shared beliefs. What beliefs do people in a community share? What values do people in a community share? How do you create an identity that is shared? Especially in a circumstance like this one, where people are coming out of their free will, where people are coming out of this horror of colonialism and shared work. And this is a couple of hundred years later, this painting, 1885. But I imagine it, hasn't, it didn't change that much in 1885 to the 1700s. We're still very in early on shaped by, by that, by the landscape, by agriculture. Well, Socorro, like I said at the very beginning, is a place that is constantly changing. And one of the things that changes is the demographics. So we start out with Socorro being founded by several hundred Biro people in the 1680s. Within a century, it's about 50% of people who are identified as Indian. Now, it could be the descendants of the people, right? But what do they identify as 80 years later? So maybe that's what the grandchildren, the grandchildren of the peop original people. Isleta, 70 years later. 500 out of 554 people are identified as Indian. So that remains, as it does today, a strong indigenous identity. Mm -hmm. Senegu is still pretty strong. San Lorenzo, like Socorro, is about 50%. So it doesn't mean that 50% of people were suddenly gone. It just means that maybe different people came in, but maybe people identified a different way. Maybe what the missions were trying to do worked. That maybe people were de-Indianized, de-tribalized. Right? So there's these demographic changes that are going on that are connected very much to changes in identity. 
changes in language? Did people still speak their language? Religious changes? So Socorro is a community that's changing. And still today, one of the things that we heard from people as we were interviewing them was that, and they weren't saying this in a negative way, but they were just saying, now there's a lot of Mexican immigrants here. And there didn't used to be a lot of Mexican immigrants here. And that changes things. And they identified as Mexican, so they weren't saying, we're not Mexican, but they were saying, our community's changing now. So it's something that's ongoing. It's not just something that's historic, it's something that's ongoing. What, what major factors could be in, in terms of indigenous communities in the population of demographic change as disease? Smallpox, typhus, etc. really hit the Indian communities heavily. They lost a large number of people. Did, did you hear that in the back? The, the importance of disease and changing the demographics as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hit the, hit the indigenous people and less community than the so-called Spanish people. Right. More right. right. When we look at these early communities in co colonial New Mexico, we see the importance of, of urban settlements of towns. Um, the mission is an important institution of religious and economic control. The presidios, the forts, like San Elisario, that is not a mission, it started as a fort. Um, and then the ranchos, that, the agricultural part. So we see all of this in the lower valley over time. I put up here uh, a statue of San Isidro. Do you know San Isidro? He's the patron saint of farmers. So you often find his image in rural communities. In New Mexico, you find him all the time because New Mexico is still very rural. I was driving up a little highway in New Mexico and I saw this sign that said congestion ahead and there were eight houses. <laughs> <laughs> so New Mexico is still very rural. And regardless of whether we're talking about an urban center or talking about a presidio, a fort, there's always a church attached to it. Not necessarily a mission, but there's a church attached to it. So the church has become very important as the centers of community. Throughout the history of colonial Mexico, the church served both as an exploiter of, of indigenous people and a protector of indigenous people. So both things are happening. But the church becomes, as it is today, a place of religious worship, a place of community celebrations, and it becomes a place of public service. And this is what we saw as we begin to interview people in Socorro. So given this history, this complex and messy history of the Lower Valley, and the fact that I had connections to teachers in the Lower Valley, in 2001 and 2, the public history program said, let's start talking to people in the Lower Valley. Let's start documenting the history. And the reason I only have two of these little booklets up is because we gave it to people in the Lower Valley. So we said, let's start talking to people and see what is important to them. And we wanted to gather today's histories. So here's what the students did, and they were very amazing students. And, and this involves several classes of graduate students. They went into the high schools, and every week they would give a little mini history lesson about the Lower Valley. Because the students didn't know their own history, just like most people in El Paso, most kids especially, don't know our history. So they gave mini history lessons to the kids. And then we taught them how to interview. So they interviewed us. So the, we arranged to have a group of older people meet us at Socorro High School on one Saturday. And this is what I love about being a public historian. It was Friday, I was on my way home. I was really excited to meet the older people the next morning when I got a phone call from the high school teacher that all of them had canceled. 
all of them had canceled because the weather was bad and they were afraid to drive the next day. So then we grabbed whoever we could that had lived in Socorro for a long time. So we ended up not interviewing who we thought. We ended up interviewing people in their 30s and 40s, which still worked, right? It still worked. So we did this several times. For several years, we did these interviews of people living in Socorro. And let me add this. We actually were very excited to discover that back in the 80s, a group of high school kids had done a series of booklets themselves, and it was called Sombras del Pasado. I don't know if any of you remember back in the 70s, if you were around in the 70s, a, a series of books that came out that were called the Foxfire books. Where, do you remember, Sue, where people, where people had interviewed older community members in Appalachia, right? It was an Appalachian project. And so they had been inspired by that project, and in the 80s they did the Lower Valley version of that, Sombras del Pasado. So we were even able to incorporate some of their work into our work 30 years later. And the people that we interviewed over the co course of those several years were very generous in sharing photographs and sharing stories. And we ended up with photographs like family photographs, you can tell you're, you're in an agricultural place because we had a lot of like chile and cotton photographs that were shared with us. You know, people talked about family, the importance of family. And they talked about the importance of generations of family being connected. And we got photographs that from the 60s, 50s, some earlier. And I wanted to share just a few of the stories that came out of these interviews that we did. This one comes from Sombras del Pasado. So I love that we were able to use the work of previous generations of, of high school students. People often talked about how traditions were passed on within their family. So this interview was with the founder of Licon's Dairy. And Mr. Licon talked about how he had learned how to make asadero cheese. Do you know Licon Dairy in the Lower Valley? Very famous for their asadero cheese. So he talked about how rather than to use chemicals to make his cheese, he used the trompillo plant. Do you know the trompillo? Yes. The trompillo grows everywhere in El Paso, and we go, there's that horrible weed. It has a purple flower that turns into a little yellow ball full of seeds. That's a trompillo. Mm -hmm. So that's a traditional way to make asadero cheese with the seeds. Mm -hmm. They make the milk, coag does milk coagulate? I don't know the right word, but whatever the milk does to make cheese, that's what the seeds do. So he talked about how that had been passed on from generation to generation in his family and how he would never change that traditional way of making the asadero cheese. Is that an indigenous name, trompillo? Where does that come from? I don't know. It might be. Uh huh. It might be. Is that nightshade? I don't know anything in English when it comes to plants, so I don't I know. I thought it was nightshade because when you have tomatoes and tumbleweeds uh, in a like in an open area, especially in the for the archaeological areas, that means that the area is no longer in context. If you find any cultural artifacts, they're no longer in context. Because now it's been heavily disturbed. So you no longer have that native vegetation coming in. Because when you have this. So when you have the trompillo, the area's been disturbed? It's been disturbed. Okay. Yeah. Because that's a yeah. good indication. Uh -huh. Has anyone written in on um, uh, botany plants in this area? Fort Bliss has an ethnobotany. Um, they have tons of stuff on that. Because the conotillo plant is one of them. You know, I know these plants and the names, but I don't really know much, anything about them. Well, like the but it was a sa it was a sacred plant of the of the Mongol Indians. Oh, it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know the canotillo? Mormon tea. It's Mormon tea. It it grows out in our desert. 
Who is? My husband does that. Oh, your husband. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. I've actually bought some of those plants. Yeah, 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 that's right. Right. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I am going to ask you about the kind of cheese. The chamis, all the chamis. Yeah, the chamis, though, yeah. So, people talked a lot about work. Right, so again, it's the same things that, that I talked about historically. People talk about their family. People talk about work. Oh, yeah. Uh, cotton, mm -hmm. Chile. Mm -hmm. The railroad was important to the lower valley, and then it bypassed the lower valley. We heard lots of stories about picking cotton. So Ambrosio Munoz, I started working when I was 13. We picked cotton. Everybody had to go out and pick cotton to survive. Mike Chavez, I started working early picking cotton. During the summer months, we would go and pick vegetables. We would stay with my grandfather, and he would pay us a dollar a week. So everybody talked about picking cotton. Mm. Even when I started teaching at UTEP in the 90s, it doesn't happen anymore, but I would have students who had picked cotton in the lower valley as children, and they would tell us how to make sure the cotton bag weighed more so they would get paid more. Mm. And it was still very alive in the 90s, the childhood picking cotton stories. Mm. We had lots of photographs of people in the military which is true of, of this community in general, that military service is a very important part of the identity of not just individuals, but the identities of families. And people really kept memories alive about the generations of their family. So you can see that we got older photographs, not just more current ones, but we got older photographs. And people kept memories alive through buildings. Buildings, the, like, look at that gas, 33 cents. <laughs> so I don't know how old it was, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> so people kept their memories alive attached to buildings. And then people kept their memories alive of generations having gone to the mission. So, 1970, again, from Sondras del Pasado, this story about the statue of San Miguel that had, and it's a st story that people still tell. It's also like, replicate other communities. Right. In, in New Mexico, I, I ran into the same story about another saint. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. Up there by Tularosa. A woman had had a saint, told me the history of it, how the ox star stopped and what have you. She's donated it to the church. And the same story. Right, yeah. right. Have I, you ever I've, heard that I've heard that. Yeah. I've heard other stories. Yeah. The yeah. same story of this statue of a saint was on its way, in this case, yeah. to Santa Fe. Right. The ox would go forward yeah. and then it would oh. go backwards so that the, the ox wouldn't leave. So then they said, oh, the saint wants to be here in Socorro, so here it is. It's amazing. It is amazing. And people still tell that story. And, and, and they say that it happened in the 1680s yeah. when it didn't. Yeah. So it's interesting how people wanted to go way, way back. And then when the Confederates were evacuating the area, mm -hmm. in, including Socorro, they started taking things forcibly from the people, you know, whatever that with horses, whatever they needed, blankets, food. And, the, and people got mad and started kicking them, you know, and hitting them. So what did they do? They brought in a cannon, and the cannon actually fired at least once or twice into the Socorro mission. And uh, and there were and eight or nine, ten or maybe more were killed by, by the Confederates, who were, who were in, evacuating. And then all of a sudden a miracle took place. A man with blonde hair on a horse came in, and and they looked at him. Everybody thought it was Saint Michael, and he talked to the soldiers, and they they got they ran out. That was their commander. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, there's fascinating yeah. stories Oral in com these communities. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Arturo Morales. When we asked him what was the biggest influence in your life, he said, my parents and five brothers <laughs> and the Socorro Mission. Mm -hmm. The Socorro Mission always came up. Mm. When we asked Maggie Chavez, what was your greatest experience? 
She talked about working in social issues, very important in the Lower Valley, things like sewage and water. But then she said, I do a lot of volunteer work at the Socorro Mission. And to me, this has been the greatest fulfillment because I've met a lot of people that have been here before me, and it brings a lot of unity. So identity, uh, family, work, all centered in the idea of, of the Socorro Mission. Maria Carmen Munoz, when we asked her, what would you like us to tell future generations? Well, I like this because she said, go to school and pay attention to your teachers. So I thought that was great. They provide the best tools to get into the world later on. And then I want to end with what was happening simultaneously to us doing these interviews that to me was, was eye-opening, was, it gave me a lot of hope, a lot of, a lot of um, optimism. In 1740, a flood, which is another thing that shapes us being by the river, a flood destroyed the mission and the community rebuilt it. In 1828, a flood destroyed the mission <laughs> and the community rebuilt it. So that show you, shows you the importance of that institution. What was happening at the same time as our oral history project was the restoration of the Socorro Mission. So in the late 1990s, the, the Restoration Committee began to f raise funds to restore the mission. And for the next five years, they worked on it. At the same time that we were doing the interviews, there was a project that was part of the restoration where youth from the Lower Valley who were high-risk youth, high risk of dropping out, were trained to do the restoration. And so I would go, because I was in the Lower Valley all the time, I would go and I would see, especially young men, you know, making adobe bricks and all kinds of physical stuff. But it had a transformation in them because they went from being high risk, about to drop out of high school kids, to kids that went to college. And what changed them was knowing their history. What changed them was understanding where they came from. And they said that. It's not me saying it, they said that. We didn't used to have any pride, and now we do. And it changed how they thought about themselves. And it was by helping to restore the mission so to me, this gave me, as, as a mother and grandmother and historian, so much hope that if we know where we come from, it grounds us and it helps us to understand ourselves better and, and what we can do. So I wanted to end with, with that because the mission was still the heart of the community, but in a way I didn't expect. I have a question. Okay. The, the flood in 1829, was that the river flooding or land? The river. The river? Yeah, the river was always flooding. That's why now it's in a concrete, concrete canal. So if the same floods hit other communities like this flood. Mm -hmm. 1740 flood wiped out not only the, the church, but the Pueblo Cemetery, everything. Mm -hmm. They had to relocate it. And today, nine days before St. Anthony Day, the tribe, with the cacique and everyone, they gather at a location near Whitney Drive and uh, El Paso County Road. And uh, they, the cacique makes prayers for directions and what have you. And they told me it was, when, back in the 60s, I asked, why was this important? They said, because this was the center of, of our land grant, everything. And then after doing studies and looking at the, uh, talking to archeologists and looking at the terrain there, you see that that area was hit by a flood. Mm -hmm. That's where the old church was and that's where the old mission was. I mean, I mean the Pueblo. You know, right. It's pretty amazing. Right. That is amazing. Yeah. Again, it's the, what memories people mm -hmm. choose to keep alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Pat, did you have a yeah, the um, flood of 1897 is the one that really changed things. And until then, there were no dams on the river, no nothing, and it just 
1897, one of the McGoffin children got married, and it had been about two weeks after in the papers that you, they count, they, put, they uh, followed the course of the flood that they knew was coming down from Colorado, which is where the Rio Grande starts, and coming down, and, they, and it flooded all the way down, they covered it, and the people of El Paso and the area did nothing to prevent the flood from covering the city. And the town and all down the valley. And it was a huge flood. Mm -hmm. We've got some very good pictures. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Pat Worthington of the Historical Society. She has a lot of things at the Historical Society that she can tell you about. But that picture, uh, Fred Feldman, who was one of the city's best photographers, mm -hmm. stood on top of the courthouse and took marvelous pictures of that flood. <laughs> but floods weren't always bad. Sometimes they were good. They brought in good soil. Right. Water and everything, you know, right. and they changed the, the river once the Isleta was on an island, you mm -hmm. know, the other adjacent communities. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other comments, questions? It's great to have experts in the audience. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? No? Well, thank you so much thank for you. coming this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. This program is made possible in part by a grant from Humanities Texas, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities.